Good morning, church. Psalm 127. Today we begin a brand new series called Castles. It is a series on the family. Psalm 127, Psalm 128. We're going to be studying here the next few weeks. I'm so excited to get to start this new series with you. But church, listen carefully. Castles is more than a sermon and series of sermons. It's going to be a family curriculum, a discipleship curriculum. I'm convinced that lives are changed, not by a single sermon or even a series of sermons, but through a process. And so uh, very soon in October, you'll have a chance to be in a discipleship group, a castles group, where you're going to get a chance to be mentored by other families or mentored by another married couple in the area of uh, your family using this curriculum that we've turned into a family discipleship curriculum. I want you to know something. This is a defining moment for our church family. I'm convinced what we're about to do is going to last far longer than a series of sermons that it's going to set a brand new trajectory for our church family for years and years and years to come as families are going to be equipped biblically to succeed in a castle that's going to stand the test of time and all the storm surges of life. And I'm convinced also that this could be a defining moment for your family, not just our church family, but your family. That if you'll really engage in this series and you'll be a part of a discipleship group, a castles group, that it could redefine your family, not just your family and your children, but your children's children and their children. I'm talking about a family legacy, a family tree that will impact not just time, but eternity. Now, we've called this series Castles. I've always been, if you know me well, a little bit of a history nerd, okay? I like history. I enjoy history. So one of my favorite trips of all time a number of years ago was to go to the UK. And you go to the UK and there's history everywhere. Like things that are 100 years old here today is like old, but there, if it's 100 years old, it's like new. And so one of the things I enjoyed doing was going around and seeing all these ancient castles. This castle is 700 years old. And it's actually in an area of Wales called Conway. Conway is a little village in Wales. And so I had a chance to go see this very castle and tour it. It's over 700 years old. It was actually built in the 1290s by King Edward I. Now, if, if you remember the movie Braveheart, like this is going to the olden days, the 90s. You guys remember Braveheart? Yeah, greatest movie of all time. Like to this day, if I'm, you know, kind of channel surfing and Braveheart is on, I will always stop at least for like 10 minutes and watch it for at least 10 minutes because I don't need to watch the whole thing because I know exactly what's going to happen next, exactly the next line, exactly how it's going to end. You know what I'm saying? So Braveheart's just one of those movies for me. Now, historically, it's not that accurate, all right? Really, it's not. But there really was a guy named William Wallace. And he really was at war with this very king, King Edward I that built this very castle in Conway, Wales, in the 1290s. Uh, So it was kind of awesome just to be there and get to see that part of history that I'm kind of intrigued by already anyway. Now, we didn't only just see this castle, guys, because this is a family series. So I'm going to maybe share some little nuggets along the way that's going to bless your family. So when we go on vacation, I always like to check out the history that's in the area. That's what we were doing. But you know the old saying is, happy wife... Happy family life, which means, guys, you have got to do some shopping along the way, okay, if you're going to have a great family vacation. And so we were doing some shopping that day that we saw this castle, and uh, we were going down this this beautiful, unique little downtown of this village called Conway. We went into this clock shop. I'll never forget this. And this clock shop was amazing, like these antique clocks that are hundreds of years old. And I was uh, asking a question about one clock specifically. I will never forget the shopkeeper looks at me and says, yeah, that clock is older than your country. (laughs) And I swear, I think I heard a little bit of resentment in his voice, just a little seed of bitterness. Like, I'm sorry we won. Okay. I'm sorry we did. But here's what's amazing. Like a hundred years old here is old there. That's new. It's amazing. Really? You've got this castle that was built over 700 years ago, and it's still there 700 years later. And you know what? 700 years from now, it will still be there. 
Now, we've called this series Castles because I'm convinced every home is to be somebody's castle and every castle is, in fact, somebody's home. The nature of a castle is that it was for fortification. It was always built on a higher elevation. These walls were meant for protection. That's what kept people on the outside from getting on the inside. You understand your home is to be a castle, is to be a place of fortification, a place of protection, a stronghold from the adversary, a place where you and your family are safe and secure, a place of peace and prosperity. Now listen carefully, ask yourself the question, what is the difference between this castle that was 700 years ago and will still be here 700 years from now and this castle that might not have lasted another seven days, maybe not even another seven minutes? This is not deep theology. I mean, this is a castle, let's be clear. This is a castle that was built by someone, and there's a lot of detail and architecture that went into that. It's a remarkable castle. It's a thing of beauty. But you understand, this castle probably did not last through the rest of the day, much less 700 years. And I want you to see the only difference between castles that last and castles that don't are where they're built and how they're built. And that is the number one thing we have to decide as a church family, but more importantly, your family specifically, where will you build and how will you build? Psalm 127 and Psalm 128 is what we're gonna be studying here in the weeks ahead because there's profound wisdom in these Psalms specifically about family and how to build your house and how to build your home in a way that will stand the test of time, in a way that will last against the storm surges of life. You can either build Build on the rock out of stone in such a way that your, your home will stand the test of time or you can build with sand and the shifting sand of this world and the storm surges of life will wash your home away. That's what's at stake as we begin this series of sermons. Psalm 127 and verse one. If you're ready for this, say let's go. Here we go. Psalm 127 verse one, written by Solomon. So much wisdom. Unless the Lord builds the house, he says, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Now, if you've ever built a house, you know the first and most important decision you make is who's gonna build your home? Who's gonna build your house? You need to choose your builder wisely. You need to build, choose your builder carefully because not all builders are the same. And this is what Solomon is now saying. He's saying, listen, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain who build it. Meaning if you try to build your own house, if you try to build your own home, if you try to be the builder of your own marriage, of your own family, it is vanity, it is futility. That's like building a sandcastle. Your family is gonna be a sandcastle story. It may look great momentarily, but eventually it will crumble. It will be washed away. And so the important thing I want you to decide today is who's going to build your marriage? By what set of specs will you build your family? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Ancient cities all were walled cities like a castle. And there were watchtowers on these walls where they could see the enemy coming from far, far away. He's saying, unless the Lord is your builder and also your protector, you are building your home in vain. Now let's be very, very clear. When Solomon uses the term house, what he he's really talking about is your home. He's saying, unless, unless the Lord builds your home, you labor in vain, who build it? You might build a house, but only the Lord can build your home. So several years ago, Chris and I actually built a home. And we don't live in it now. We live in a different house, but we, we built this home two, two houses ago. To be clear, we didn't literally build the house. All right, just to be clear, I would not want to live in a house that I literally personally built. Because it wouldn't be safe for anybody to enter. I'm just being upfront with you. But we had a house built. And we chose our builder wisely. Why? Because this is the most important. Before you get to what kind of carpet am I going to put in the bedrooms? Before you get to what paint color do I want on the walls? Oh, before you get to the, the wallpaper. Do you know wallpaper's coming back? I had no idea, really. The house we live in now, we spend all kinds of time getting the wallpaper off. Now it's coming back. So if you got wallpaper, just leave it. All right? By the time you want to sell it, it'll be back. All right? Just hang on. 
But before you, before you settle on any of that, wallpaper here, paint here, carpet here, hey, the most important thing you're gonna settle on is who's gonna build it and on what will you build. What's the most important part of a house? Is it the part you can see or the part you cannot see? See, it's the foundation, isn't it? The most important part of the house, no matter how beautiful it may look outwardly, no matter how grandiose it may be when you look at it from the outside, if it's built on a weak foundation, it is not going to stand the test of time. The cracks are immediately going to emerge, and the erosion is going to begin, and that house will not stand, no matter if it's a thing of beauty, no matter how architecturally, aesthetically beautiful it might be, the most important thing you're going to do is choose the builder carefully, choose them wisely wisely and make certain that they have a good foundation to build on. And that is what Solomon is now teaching, guys. Who will build your house and where will you build your house? On what will you build your house? And when I talk about your house, I'm talking about your home. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your marriage. Now, why are we doing a series of sermons on the family? Why have we taken the last year honestly, and taking this content and put it into a discipleship curriculum so that it outlives these series of sermons we're about to do. So that years and years from now, families coming to Abundant Life will still have access to this content and they can go through a discipleship curriculum called Castles so that they can build a house and a home that's gonna stand the test of time. Let me tell you a couple of reasons why. Number one is this. Family is an area we all care about, don't we? It doesn't matter who you are. What I know about people, hey, even in our own city, your, your own neighbors, your coworkers, unlike you, they might not care at all about God, but they care a lot about their kids. Yes? I know people, listen, they don't even believe in God, but they sure do believe in their family. They might not care at all about God, but they care deeply about their kids. They may not love Jesus, but they really, really love their kids. This is an opportunity. I want to encourage you to invite somebody with you, maybe even somebody that's far from God that doesn't really know Jesus like you do, because this is the kind of thing that is a bridge to everybody, because I don't know anybody that wants to have a poor family. I don't know anybody that doesn't want to succeed as a family. Think about this, nobody, I don't care who you are, nobody gets married, stands at the altar, takes their vows, says I do, and as they take their vows, says I do, nobody gets married on that day of celebration, taking their vows, saying I do, nobody in the back of their mind is going, wow, I hope this ends in divorce. Yeah, I hope that this ends in divorce, and division, and separation, and suffering, and trauma. Nobody gets married hoping it ends that way. People get married hoping that it's happily ever after, don't they? Everybody does. Nobody has a baby for the first time, and I'll never forget, one of the greatest moments of my life is becoming a father for the first time. One of the greatest moments is becoming a dad, and I never will forget my son being born, my oldest son, in that moment. And I want you to think back, if you're a father, if you're a mother, in that moment, nobody has a baby, and secretly they're going to themselves, I hope that I'm a bad dad. I hope I'm a terrible dad. Nobody is going, man, I hope I'm a terrible mother. Nobody does that. What we want is to be a great dad. I mean, we naturally want to be a great mother. Nobody goes, man, I hope I'm awful at this. Everybody wants to succeed at family. And that is why we're doing this series, because it matters so deeply to everybody. It matters so deeply to me. It matters so deeply to you. But more importantly, check this out. Family matters to God, too. Did you know that God is the author of family? He's the originator of family. God is the author of marriage. He's the originator of marriage. It is not creation. It is not culture. It is not government. It is not human civilization that originally manufactured the family. It was nobody's idea but God. You see, family is the institution of God. Marriage is an institution of God. When you look in Scripture, there are three institutions of God for the good order and the health and prosperity of human civilization. And check this out. Marriage and family is one of them. See, marriage and family is the fabric of society. 
And that is why family is near and dear to the heart of God. Not only is it the fabric of society, if our society is in erosion, it's because families are in disintegration. See, families are the glue, they're the fabric of society. So if we live in a civilization and we can see the foundation in erosion, it all comes back to the health of families. And not only is it near and dear to the heart of God because it's the fabric of society, but check this out. It is near and dear to the heart of God because God is the Father and he loves his sons and daughters. See, God is all about a family, his family. And as a child of God, you're part of the family of God. And God wants to teach us everything we cannot see by giving us a picture of something we can see. So he gives us the physical picture of family to teach us what it means to be a part of a spiritual family. And that is why God has so much to say about this in his word. That's why the Bible is full of wisdom about how to build a healthy family. It is near and dear to the heart of God. And it's near and dear to your heart, I'm convinced, and my heart, I'm convinced. Because I don't know of anything else this side of heaven that matters more than our families and succeeding as a family. You might build a house, but listen, only the Lord can build your home. Now here's the simple reality. We live at a time where the world has tried to build family with a different set of specs. We live in a civilization in chaos in a time of confusion, of separation, division, animosity, hostility, where this divide is growing and we can all sense it and we can all see it. And the reason why is very simple. We live in a society that's in rebellion against God. What we've said is we know more about marriage than God. We know more about family than God. We know more about raising children than God. And so consequently, the Lord is not building our home. We're trying to do it our way. We're trying to do it a different way. And let's just be honest. The social science does not lie. The statistics tell the truth. It's not not going very good out there, is it? It's not going very good. I mean, this is not some preacher's propaganda. This is just the stats. These are the facts. Today's kids, today's teenagers are the most addicted generation in the history of our nation, the loneliest generation in the history of our nation. STDs among America's teens at an all-time high. Suicide among America's teens at an all-time high. Worry, anxiety among an all-time high. We have a whole counseling center full of LPCs, licensed professional counselors, and one of the number one things they deal with are kids specifically that are completely paralyzed paralyzed by insecurity and worry and anxiety. One has to ask why. And this is what none of the talking heads on any talk show host is going to tell you. The reality is it all comes back to the family. Healthy families make healthy kids. But to have healthy families, we got to have healthy marriages. Hey, the number one thing we can do for our kids is have a healthy marriage. Now here's the reality, when I say we're we're living by a different set of specs, we're allowing the world to tell us how to build our homes and tell us how to run our lives and tell us how to build our marriages. Here's just the stats, these are just the facts. In 1960, only 5% of American kids were being raised without their biological father. Today, almost 50% of American kids are being raised without their biological father. 40 to 50% of American marriages end in divorce. Which means 40 to 50% of American kids are being raised in a broken home, a broken family. Listen very carefully. Broken homes mean broken hearts. It's broken lives. And I would suggest the reason why is we've allowed other people to tell us how to run our life. We've allowed other people to tell us how to build our home, how to build our families. And so I'm simply going to say, and you'll hear me say it more than once, for best results, we're going to consult the manufacturer. You're going to hear me say some controversial things in the next few weeks about marriage and family that you won't hear anybody else say out there. Because we're not going to talk about what they say, the last talk show you heard, or maybe the last podcast you heard, or the latest child psychiatrist. We're going to see what does God say. We're going to go to God's word. Everybody in? Because I will promise when we do it God's way, the blessings of God will follow. The blessings of God will follow. 
And this is why Solomon begins simply saying, unless the Lord build your house, you labor in vain, who build it? You see, unless the Lord build your home, you labor in vain that build it. But we live in a civilization that hasn't let God be the builder, he hasn't let God be the one to tell us the blueprints from which to build. Consequently, we are eating now as a society of the bread of sorrows. And that's what it says in verse two. Look at what it says in verse two. It is vain for you to rise up early to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Vain, it's vanity, it is futility. To stay up late and get up early. What he's saying is you working harder, trying harder, doing better, white knuckling it, I really mean it this time, determination, no listen carefully, he's saying that's vanity, futility. You're not gonna fix your marriage, you're not gonna save your family by just working harder. You need to work smarter. And because we haven't worked smarter, in fact, to society, I'm just going to say we're getting dumber. Because the wisdom of God is completely contrary to the empty wisdom of men and the empty wisdom of our present civilization. But because we've chosen to believe others rather than believing God, we're not eating of the bread of sorrows. That's the statistics. That is simply the social science. Eating of the bread of sorrows. When the reality is God has something better, he wants to prosper your home. Look at what it says. For so he gives his beloved sleep. You know what God is teaching? He wants your home to be a place of rest, not war. Why are so many homes a war zone? I'll tell you why. Because every castle has a king and every castle has a queen. I don't mind telling you, I am king of my castle. Just ask my wife. And I don't mind telling you, She's the queen of her castle. Just ask me. Yes, our castle has a king, our castle has a queen. Now, in most homes, that king and that queen are constantly struggling for the throne. Who's going to be in control of this home? But in our home, it's not a war zone. Can I tell you why? Because although I'm the king and she's the queen, we both serve a high king, the king of kings, the king of heaven, whose name is Jesus, and there's only one throne, and it's King Jesus that sits on the throne of our home. That's how your home is no longer a war zone. And that's when suddenly you no longer are eating of the bread of sorrows. It says, for he gives his beloved sleep. He wants your home. He wants your family. He wants your castle to be a place of rest, not war. He wants your castle to be a place of refuge, not work. Hey, we work and we war out there all day long, all week long. When you come home, it ought to be a place of rest and refuge. When your kids come home, they've been at school, it's been a horrible day, it's been a difficult day. But when they come home, they ought to have a sense of safety and security, of refuge from the warfare. When you come home from work, it ought to be a place of retreat and refuge, a place where you get sleep and rest, not work and war. That's what God desires for you. That is the end game of what God wants for your family. I'll never forget, I don't think Jake would want me to share this with you, but I'm going to share it anyway. Sorry, son. So when he was uh, away at school at the University of Arkansas, he came home one weekend. And he says to me, I'll never forget this, it meant so much to me. He didn't know how much it meant at the time. He said, Dad, when I come home, I feel like I'm coming home to the Shire. Now, you guys have seen Lord of the Rings, yes? If you haven't seen Braveheart, you need to see it. If you haven't seen Lord of the Rings, just binge it, okay? We used to binge Lord of the Rings. My kids were at home. Don't judge me. <laughs> so if you know anything about the Lord of the Rings, you know you've got the Shire, right? And, uh, you know, it's dark uh, in the world. It's full of war and wickedness. But the Shire, the music is playing. The sky is always sunny. It's a place of tranquility and peace and security. That's what he was trying to say. And I was so happy you said it at the time. But then I realized, well, if that's true, that makes me a hobbit. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be a hobbit, okay? Because I have to grow hair on my feet. I'd rather be like Aragorn, you know, with the sword and the bow. And I'm just saying. But in some way, it ought to be the Shire. It's warfare out there. It is dark. It is dangerous everywhere. But when I come home, it's the Shire. 
a place of safety, security, peace, and prosperity. That's what God desires for your family personally. And except the Lord build the house, he labor in vain that build it. It will never be a place of prosperity and peace and security and safety if you don't decide today to let the Lord be your builder, the Lord be your provider, the Lord be your protector, that he is the architect, he has the blueprint, and we're gonna build, no matter what anybody else says, doesn't matter what they say, we're gonna build according to what God says. Yes, this is the decision to make today. Because some of us, honestly, we don't have a home of peace and prosperity. It's a war zone. It's anarchy. It's survival of the fittest. When you show me a home where mom and dad are going at it, I'll show you a home where the kids are going crazy. Today, it's a day to raise the white flag, raise the flag of surrender. Jesus, we surrender to you, the author, the originator, the one that knows better, our true provider, our true protector. Now, this is our family today. This is a recent picture of our family as as it looks today. And uh, you have Jake, my oldest son. His wife is Abby. You have my daughter, McKay. Her husband is Daniel. You have, of course, Krista and me, and that's my youngest son on the end, Josh. And this really is a picture of who we are today. Like if you could be a fly in a wall in our family gatherings, a picture says a thousand words. What you see here is a family that is truly happy, truly peace with each other. We truly enjoy each other's company, long for each other's company. We have some of the best times together. Uh, This picture is going to change through the years as it has already. Uh, One day we're going to add a daughter-in-law to this picture and about 25 grandchildren. Yeah, if I could paint that picture, that's what it would look like, okay? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have the paintbrush, can't do it all myself. Some things you cannot do for your kids. They gotta do it for themselves. But this picture's gonna change. Eventually there's gonna be more people. Now, if you could step back in time though, step back a few years. It wasn't this picture, um, it was this picture. This was a picture we took in front of our pond shortly before uh, our kids started to kind of grow up and leave the house. Uh, And Jake, I think, was a senior, and he was about to go off to school. And again, you hear the picture says a thousand words. Not always. Pictures can lie. Because what you see in this picture, much like the previous picture, is a family that is happy and it's clappy. Everybody's smiling, at peace with each other. But if we're going to tell the truth, it wasn't always like that in the Hopper home. And I'm telling you that because some of us are thinking, well, Phil, yeah, all all right, yeah, you're Pastor Phil. You just have a perfect family, and everything's always come easily. I know what you're thinking because long before I was up here, I sat out there, and I often thought to myself, preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. Like, you've got the perfect life, and everything is easy, and I'm trying to tell you, there is not one among us with the perfect family. Not one among us has done everything perfectly. We've all had to work through a little dysfunction and division and just plain old sinful decisions. Just to be clear about this, we go through the same stuff because we're made of the same stuff. And I'm trying to tell you today, but today can be the declaration where you build on a brand new foundation and it becomes a brand new destination. Because a lot of us are thinking, Phil, yeah, this is going to be Mr. Ideal, but my life is real. Well, the truth is it's true of us all. And I just want to be honest with you today. Because uh, while we look one way, it wasn't always this way. For example, if you step back in time, Chris and I will have 32 years of marriage in October the 5th. 32 years of marriage. Hard to believe. Man, how did we get there? Sometimes I don't even know. I'm just saying don't blink. It goes faster than you think. But if we were to step back in time, in the early days of our marriage, this picture would look more like this. Duct tape on my mouth. Because there were times in the early years of our marriage that I might not talk to my wife for three days. I would give her the silent treatment. That was my way of dealing at the time. I didn't know what I know now, but it was my way of dealing with what amounted to feeling inadequate, insecurities, anxieties. Ladies, it does not matter what a man looks like outwardly. He might be six foot six, 245, and he can whoop just about any man alive. At least that's what I want you to think. That's what I wanted her to think. But simple truth is, as human beings, we all have insecurities. 
And I didn't know then what I know now. My way of dealing with insecurities, when she would get too close and she would hit a trigger and mirror, mirror on the wall, am I man enough at all? Mirror, mirror on the wall, am I strong enough at all? Am I doing any good at all? And sometimes the mirror would talk back and say, you're not enough, inadequate, can't measure up, wasn't her, it was me. I didn't know then what I know now. Personal insecurities, feeling unworthy, I would retreat because every man will retreat from whatever it is makes him feel weak. And my way of dealing with it, instead of leaning into it, was zip my lips. I'm taking back control of my home. Yeah, some of us here are doing the same thing, aren't you? How's it working for you? Never worked very good for me. And if we're being honest, not only would I have had duct tape on my lips, but there would have been a big question mark on Krista because she was a mystery to me. Like, I'm married to you, but I don't even feel like I know you. Like, as much as I try to understand you, like, I I just don't get you. And some of you are giggling because you know it's true. Yeah. Oh, 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, with understanding. Every woman wants to be known, to be understood. The way you know them is to talk to them and listen to them. But my way of dealing with a sense of inadequacy, like I I can't unlock the combination. My, My way was to retreat, zip my lip. You're a big question mark. It's more about you than it is about me. Some of you are already judging me. Come on, you know I'm not the only one. Now, if she was a big question mark, it's because she looked at me and she saw a masked man. (laughs) Who is this man behind the mask? How can I be married to somebody I don't even know? And the truth is, I would wear a mask. What is intimacy? What we long for is intimacy. We were made for intimacy. What is intimacy? Into me see. But if you're full of insecurity and anxiety and feelings of unworthy, you're not going to let anyone see into you personally, not deeply. And so I, I had a mask on for many years. I did. I didn't know I had a mask on, but I had a mask on. What did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? They immediately did what? They ran and they hid. They sewed fig leaves together to hide the parts of themselves that brought them shame of which they felt blame. And do you understand every couple since has done the same thing? We play the blame game and we mask up and we hide from one another instead of leaning into one another and helping us overcome the hitches and hangups that we have with one another. That was me for a lot of years. I would mask up, not going to let you see me because you might see something that makes me feel weak, insecurity. Now, it wasn't just Krista and I. Listen, if I'm being honest about this family photo, it would look different. The reality is simply this. There was a wedge between me and my oldest son. When he was a toddler, I thought I knew exactly what I was doing. I had a plan for him. And by the way, as a part of this curriculum, Castle's curriculum, we're going to publish a path for every parent to follow. There are 10 markers along the way. You need to have attention and intention. You need to know exactly what you're trying to accomplish in the life of your child in every single season. I thought I knew what I was going to do. But I will promise by the time he was a teenager, it didn't look like anything I thought that it would. And I was so disappointed. I was so hurt by my oldest son. I had pictured in my mind's eye that one day when he leaves the home, he graduates high school, and I drop him off at college, that it's going to be me and my oldest son, locked arm, running arm in arm at a full stride, at a full pace, and together we're going to break the tape, and it's going to be cause of celebration and chest bumps. I'm telling you, by the time I dropped him off at Columbia, Missouri to go to school at Mizzou, which, by the way, shows you the love of a father. And what a father will do when a man from KU is writing big checks to Mizzou. Just saying. I dropped him off that day, guys. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I literally, instead of breaking the tape, arm in arm, chest bump, son, I'm pr- I felt like I was on my hands and knees, just barely crawling to finish line. And the truth is, he had hurt me very deeply. He didn't mean to. He was just a kid. In some ways, he was just being a kid, doing what kids do. See, in my mind, I had this ideal. (laughs) But then your kids hit teenagers, and then it's real. (laughs) 
And there was a reason I didn't do a parenting series. I didn't do a family series as Pastor Phil for years and years. In the early days I did, when my kids were this size, I did a lot of them back in the day. By the time my kids were this size, I don't know if you know, if you've been listening to me a long time, but I did not do one of these series for years and years and years. You know why? Because I was swimming through water I had never run through. I was swimming through water I had never been through. And I needed to swim through some waters before I was gonna preach through. <laughs> Until I got out on the other side. Now I'm on the other side. And I can look back. And at the time, I wondered if I knew anything about parenting. I don't know how this is going to end. It's not looking like it's going to end the way I thought it would end. Here's the reality. It did end the way I thought it would end. I did know a lot of what I thought I knew. I had to make some halftime adjustments. So it had to be an a adjustment in, you know, kind of mid-strategy. I mean, it's going to be different than you look like when they hit teens. You have to have a plan. I had a plan. I wasn't sure by the time they were teens if, if I knew what to do. I did know a lot of what to do. I didn't know everything I needed to do. And at the time, there was a wedge between us. And it broke a father's heart. Our kids have no idea how much they can break their mom and dad's heart. Why can they break our hearts? Because we love them more than anyone on this planet, don't we? And the people you love the most have the power to hurt you the most. And that's why our kids have the power to hurt us. Now, most people would look at my daughter and think, well, she's the angel of the family. I mean, she's got the halo. And I can say today, my daughter is a woman of virtue. She oozes Jesus. I'm so proud of who she is. A woman of God, loves the word of God. But there was a time, I will promise, she did not get the halo. She was not the angel other people thought that she was. In fact, when I looked at her, I didn't always say a halo. What I saw was horns. <laughs> she was my most rebellious child, guys, I'm telling you. She was what we call today strong-willed. By far and away, she was my most stubborn child. She was my most rebellious child. I'm telling you, I'm going to say some things along the way that's going to be completely contrary to what the world says. I don't know if you realize this or not, but when you look in Scripture, do you know we have God as a father and he spanks his sons and daughters? <laughs> Hebrews 12, look at it for yourself. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he spanks every son and daughter that he receives. And he that is without spanking is an illegitimate son or daughter, meaning if you can sin and not get spanked by God your father, you're not really one of his. Guess what, I spanked my children. I did not beat them, that's different. I did not injure them, that's criminal. But I spanked them. God spanks his. Do you know more about parenting than him? Let me tell you something, my daughter got more spankings than her brothers combined. And at the time, I'm going, God, this isn't working. It was. It was. Sometimes it takes a long time to see the return on investment. There was a return. She's a beautiful, godly woman today. And she no longer sees, I no longer see the horns, and she now has the halo. But the reality is, there are times she looked at me, I saw the horn, she saw the pitchfork. That's what she saw. And these two guys here today, grown men, they are best of buds. I mean, they really are very close friends. I consider both of my sons today in my inner circle. You talk community, they are both confidants. I respect them not simply as my sons, but I respect them now as my brothers. They are brothers in Christ, and I look at them today as men. But if we go back long enough... There was separation between them. You talk about sibling rivalry, guys. There were days I had to get in between them because they were going to blows. Oh, yeah, Pastor Phil, he has one happy family. Just look at them in that photo. Everybody's smiling. No, you don't understand. There was a time when they were growing up, I was all-time quarterback. We'd go out in the yard. I was all-time quarterback. One of them be receiver. One would be cover, and then they would trade. I finally came to the conclusion after I got, we're done. We're done. Never again. Because the sibling rivalry was so deep, I would literally have to break them up. And this was Pastor Phil's family. 
And I'm simply trying to tell you today that we all go through the same thing. We all go through the same stuff of all I might have done wrong and in those things I did not fully understand. The one thing I got right is the main thing I had to get right and the one thing you got to get right is you've got to decide who will be the builder of your life, who will be the builder of your home. And this is why in the end, the Hopper family story has a happy ending. Because in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the confusion, when I wasn't sure I even knew what I was doing, it was God who was the builder, God who is the protector. See, the difference between homes that last and homes that don't is where they're built and how they're built. Will you build on the foundation? Will you build on the rock of ages? That is the Lord Jesus Christ, except the Lord builds the house. They labor in vain who build it. Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, everybody say, does them. Does them. God is not looking for people who merely hear the word of God. He's looking for people who does the word of God. Will you do it? This is one thing I decided many years ago. Matters not if you are single and want to be married or married and wish you were single. Some of you didn't hear what I just said. Matters not if you have kids, no kids. It matters not your season of life, your situation in life. Every person here is building a life. Every person here is building a home. It matters not your situation, married or single, kids, no kids. You must decide today that I'm gonna be a hearer of God's word and a doer of God's word, that Jesus Christ is going to be the author of my life. I will surrender all rights to the Lord Jesus Christ. His will in my life is always right. He's never wrong. He said, there's two kinds of builders. You're gonna build your house, you're gonna build your life, you're gonna build your home like a wise person or a foolish person. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Why are so many marriages falling, crumbling? Why are so many families falling, crumbling? Why are so many kids in the middle of so much destruction, Jesus makes it very clear. It has to do with your foundation. It's the difference between a castle that lasts and a castle that doesn't. This castle will still be there 700 years from now. It's over 700 years old. This castle might not have lasted another seven minutes, much less another seven days. They're both castles. One is built out of stone, rock. It's built on a higher elevation. It's built on a sure foundation. The other is built on sand that will eventually wash away. There is a storm surge coming for all of us. The waves come over and over again. And if you have not built your house, on the right foundation, it will get washed away. And it's happened over and over again, church. How about today we say never again? How about today every person here says, I'm gonna build on the rock. And in scripture, it's very clear, check this out. The rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. The rock is the word of God. The rock is the son of God. He is the sure foundation. The son of God is your location. He is your higher elevation. The word of God is your foundation. And when you build your life in the right location, you build your life on the right foundation, it will stand any storm surge the world brings against you. And this is the reason why I can say today, looking back, I love now that my kids are old enough to actually debrief with them. Hey guys, let's talk about that when you were 14. You know, give me the grade card. (laughs) What went well, what didn't go well, seriously. Now that it has a happy ending, we can look back. You know what? It all comes back to this one thing. 
the Hopper home was not built by a man named Phil. The Hopper home was built by the resurrected Son of God named Jesus. He is the right location. You need a higher elevation. Not the sands of this world that are always shifting, always changing. He is the fortification. He is the foundation. And that is the call on all of our lives. I'm out of time. I know I got more blanks for you to fill out. The good news is we got next week. The biggest thing this week is you decide, Jesus, it's going to be your way. So if you'll make that decision today for your life, whether you're married or single, for your home, for your marriage in every space, in every place, church houses, other campuses in our city right here in this Lee Summit Auditorium, I want to make a declaration today, a declaration that we're going to build on the right foundation that's going to redefine your destination. Would you stand with me right now before our God, every person in every place? Joshua 24, 15. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Church, I made that decision a long time ago. If I'm the only one, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Matters not what my neighbors say, my coworkers say, my friends, my family, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are you willing to make that declaration? Are you willing to build your life on that sure foundation? Then right now, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands to the heavens, this universal sign of surrender. I wanna pray blessing over you, over every marriage, over every family, over every single one of our sons and daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, every single person here today. You're building your life. You're building your home. And Jesus, together, we make this declaration that we will build on the right foundation the rock of ages, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the Son of God, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And let this day be a defining day, a defining moment that will affect more than time, a family legacy, a family tree that will stretch clear into eternity. I pray, God, for each of our children and their children and their children's children's children that for generations to come, because of the decisions that we make today and in the coming weeks, lives will be changed forever and ever into eternity. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Church, I love you much. God bless each of you.